Hello, and welcome back to Pete's Behavioural Insights and Theories, aka Pete's Bits. Today we're talking about the halo effect, but before we do that, I just want to say another big thank you. This week we passed yet another subscriber milestone, 250 subscribers already. I can't thank you enough for the amazing support on the channel, and a few of you even left some very, very nice comments on the last video, which of course is super encouraging for me to hear. So, thank you again for the amazing support, and if you're watching these videos and you enjoy them, and you haven't yet subscribed, please can you subscribe by hitting that red subscribe button down below this video, and by ringing that notification bell, I'd really appreciate it. So, let's talk about the halo effect. So in 2009, television history was made. This unassuming woman from Scotland steps onto the stage of Britain's Got Talent. The crowd gives her a sceptical look. Some of them even roll their eyes, and some of them begin to laugh. Everyone's expecting a joke, a flop of a performance. But then, Susan Boyle opens her mouth. I dreamed a dream in time gone by. This is such a magical moment in British television, and Piers Morgan sums up the emotions of the audience really well in his comments. Stood there with that cheeky grin and said, I, I want to be like a lame page. Everyone was laughing at you. No one is laughing now. That was stunning. An incredible performance. But if you think about it, it doesn't really make much sense for us to have been judging Susan Boyle in this way. Your appearance actually has no correlation with your ability to sing well. This was Britain's Got Talent, not Britain's Got Good Looking People. And yet, when Susan Boyle steps on the stage, we all assume that she's going to be a bad singer. This is an example of the halo effect, or in fact, in Susan Boyle's case, it's the horn effect. Because Susan Boyle was unattractive, we thought that she would perform poorly in other metrics too, even ones which are unrelated, like her singing performance. And according to behavioral science research, we make these kind of judgments based on appearance all the time. In a study from 1972 conducted on the relationship between attractiveness and the halo effect, they took 60 students, 30 males and 30 females from the University of Minnesota, and they gave them a few different photos to look at. One of a very attractive individual, one of an averagely attractive individual, and one of an unattractive individual. And what the participants were asked to do was rate how happy these people would be in the long run. And all their results showed was that people who were more attractive were estimated to have more likeable personalities, have better marriages, and even have better long-term job outcomes. So just like in the case of Susan Boyle on the stage, people were making a judgment based on attractiveness at the beginning, and assuming that that would carry on through to other factors of life that were completely unrelated to physical appearance. The attractiveness halo effects also applies to how people rate our academic performance. In another study from 1974, 60 male undergraduate students were given both well-written and poorly written essays to evaluate. One third of them were given a photo of an attractive female author, one third were given a photo of an unattractive female and were told that she was the author, and one third were given no photo at all. They were the control group. And here's what their results showed. When it came to the good quality essay, those who received the photo of the attractive candidate scored it about the same as if there was no photo at all. But the participants who were given the photo of the unattractive candidate rated the essay as a little bit lower. And the really juicy part of this study is when we look at the poorly written essay. So when it came to the poorly written essay, the attractive candidate was given a significant boost over the no photo condition, suggesting that Participants were very willing to give the attractive candidate the benefit of the doubt when the essay was bad. And when the bad essay was paired with the unattractive photo, oof, the scores got really, really low and participants were extremely harsh at marking the poorly written essay far lower than the no photo condition. So attractiveness is really important for the halo effect. That's because most of the time our first impression is based on visual information. What somebody or something looks like. But there are a few instances where our first impression doesn't come from how people look. An example of this can come straight out of Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. In Thinking Fast and Slow, Kahneman talks about his problem when he used to mark his students' essays. If he was given two essays, the sequence in which he read them made a big effect on the overall grade at the end. If he read a very good essay to begin with, he was much more likely to be lenient if the second essay was poorly written. This is how he put it in his book. If a student had written two essays, one strong and one weak, I would end up with different final grades depending on which essay I read first. I had told the students that the two essays had equal weight, but that was not true. 
The first one had a much greater impact on the final grade than the second. So sequencing matters and first impressions are really, really important. And that doesn't just apply to people, but even to brands. So if you've been following this channel for a while now, you probably know that I have a bit of an obsession with McDonald's. So yes, I did find a Halo Effect paper that looked at McDonald's. In this paper, they were comparing McDonald's and Subway as two fast food restaurants who position themselves differently to create different first impressions with regards to health. Subway tries to position themselves as a more healthy fast food option, whereas McDonald's, not so much. And what they found is that if a food company positions themselves as healthy, then people are far more likely to underestimate the total number of calories in the meals that they're eating. They took McDonald's meals and Subway meals of equal calorie value and asked people to make estimates of how many calories were in them. And on average, people estimated the Subway meals to have 151 fewer calories than the McDonald's meals, even though they were exactly the same in terms of calories. And what's even worse is when it comes to the side orders. So not only do they underestimate the calorie content of the main meals, but as a result of them assuming that the calorie content is lower, they feel more justified in ordering more side orders and high calorie drinks. So when participants were given vouchers for either a Big Mac or a Subway sandwich, despite the Subway sandwich having 50% more calories than the Big Mac. People assumed that it was lower calorie and therefore added even more calories onto their order by ordering cookies and a drink on top. And the authors dubbed this the food halo effect. By creating this first impression of healthiness, people assume that all of their food is far lower calorie than it really is. And so we're very, very bad at estimating how much food they were actually eating. And it was a big, big misjudgment. So what are some of the implications of the halo effect research I've presented for you today? So as per usual, the first lesson is just awareness. Be aware that the halo effect exists, it's very strong, it's very prevalent, and if you're assessing the performance of a candidate, especially one who you are physically attracted to, you are almost certainly overestimating their performance on subjective measures. So to try and avoid this bias and get the best quality candidates for your company, you definitely want to be using as many objective measures of performance as possible. If you base your decision off the objective measures of performance, you're far less likely to be subject to the halo effect. But honestly, it's pretty hard to defend against the halo effect. It's such an ingrained part of our decision making and it happens so fast we often can't defend ourselves from it. So instead, what perhaps might be a more useful lesson is how you can use the halo effect to your own advantage. And so I guess the main implication that you should take away from this video is that taking care of yourself is super duper important. Being attractive really does matter, and here's all this social psychology research to back that up. Obviously, there's lots of genetic factors that we can't control when it comes to attractiveness. Things like our height or our facial features that we were born with. But there are lots of things that we also can control. If we eat more healthily and train, especially you training with weights, we're obviously gonna come across as more attractive. And if just the sound of that is too horrible, then there's even things that you can do in the immediate term to come across as more attractive. Take a shower, wear deodorant, clip your nails. Retract your shoulder blades and puff out your chest. You'll come across as more confident, more attractive, and if you work on your elocution, your articulation, people who are more eloquent and articulate tend to come across as more confident, attractive, and likable. And finally, smile. Not only smile because you learned a valuable lesson today, but smiling is a good primer for the halo effect. If you smile at someone else and then they smile back at you, you've established the beginnings of rapport. And if their first impression of you is you smiling and they like you, they're far more likely to evaluate all your other attributes as positive also. So I'll leave you with a quote from Oscar Wilde. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. Hey, congratulations, you made it to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please remember to subscribe down below and ring that notification bell if you haven't already. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up and leave me a comment. Let me know what topics you wanna to see in the future. I got some really exciting plans for some videos upcoming, so you don't wanna miss out. Next week, we're talking about a really hotly debated concept in behavioral science, and that is priming. Is it real? Does it work? And what are some of the implications of it? So if you wanna see that, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.